Hi and welcome to week three of class. I hope everyone had a, a wonderful break um, and were able to get some rest during this time. Uh, I apologize for not uh, getting some notes to you early on and getting this video out in time, but uh, I hope that the video proves to um, be useful for you as you engage and continue to read the work of Deem and Welton. Uh, today's topic is um, the second con the continuation of marker-driven color evasive logics in schooling, and um, uh, as you know and as you've read, um, they're really continuing this this idea of. Um, uh, kind of probing into the ways in which racism and market-driven logics have really kind of um, taken over schools and have become the norm in which uh, we operate within schools and just about every particular facet. And so um, this particular week, uh, Demon Welton cover um, uh, student testing, they cover um, school discipline, and uh, and then they kind of wrap up with some ideas of what um, educators can do. And so um, we're going to kind of dive right in and really get into the topic of um, uh, standardized testing. Uh, I think that, that what Demon Welton were really trying to get at in this particular uh, uh, chapter is that the idea of, of standardized testing kind of, you know, is more, is a really recent phenomenon. Um, you saw it kind of really take off with um, No Child Left Behind, um, but its roots are kind of, you know, they really go back just a little bit more. Um, they go back to the Reagan administration and they even go back farther to, um, to the Johnson administration with the development of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which really, um, uh, in 1965, which really kind of fomented and, and started this idea Idea of addressing uh, the needs of marginalized kids, and and although they argue that uh, although the um, the 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 logics were kind of you know were based in trying to produce some sort of equity and support some sort of equitable outcomes, um, they were really kind of race neutral. And so, if, if you want to kind of trace back the the history of racial neutrality, um, it really kind of emerges from. Uh, from the Elementary and Secondary Edu Education Act, which uh, which kind of started the whole the whole ball rolling, and so everything, all the all the new policies that really have have emerged post um, Elementary and Secondary Education Act have all been basically reiterations or revisitations of the Elementary Secondary and Secondary Education Act um, uh, of 1965. They call them reauthorizations, and so every once in a while, a new president will come in, they will reauthorize the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Um, and kind of give it its own spin. And so what we've seen uh, since the, really since the Reagan administration have been iterations of, uh, of reauthorizations of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. If you think, if you think about the Reagan administration's uh, A Nation at Risk, it really kind of looked at, um, at, at the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and started saying, okay, what is it about this that, that, um, that, that's going on in, in schools and, um, and why are schools failing why you know they, they there was this big report um that started out in in 1982 that um that uh it was titled the nation at risk and and uh the 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 basic premise of that report was that um uh, schools were failing. Schools were failing society. They were failing kids. They were failing the economy, and our nation was at risk as a result. If you compared our test our test results with um, with other uh, uh, industrialized and industrializing nations at that time, we weren't doing very well. Um, and so the idea was, what we needed to do was really kind of strengthen our our um, our, our school system uh, in order for us to um, uh, strengthen our economy and strengthen our competitiveness across the globe and if we didn't do that our nation you know um, would suffer and so the idea that the nation being at risk was something that we needed to look at and something that we needed to take seriously um, uh, and um, if you look at the the the, um, the, the iteration post uh, the Reagan administration um, uh, America's 2000 with George H.W. Bush. Now that was not a reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act but America's 2000 what George H.W. Bush did was um, he uh, uh, convened a group of governors across the uh, across the United States and basically um, 
uh, had, had a, they came up with a, a set of, of knowledges, kind of a knowledge base that all kids need to know. And so they established this idea that there was, that there was particular knowledges in math, science, English, um, history, etc. That, that needed to be learned by all kids. So they began to kind of operationalize and quote unquote standardize the, um, the, the, the curriculum. And, um, and so the idea that, that if kids weren't kind of meeting minimal, you know, this, this, this level of learning um, or these knowledges, then they, then they were kind of at a disadvantage. Um, and and they were doing a disservice to this country. Um, George, that that continued with uh, uh, goals two thousand uh, under the Clinton administration, and um, and with uh, with uh, goals two thousand, um, the the ideas of of um, uh, beginning to test. Uh, kids really started to kind of you know to 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 take off standardized testing uh, to the extent of of what was laid the, the foundation that was laid with America's 2000 this kind of discrete sets of knowledges that kids needed to know and um, and we needed to be testing on really kind of took off within within the the, the Clinton administration under the goals 2000 um, uh, act uh, by the time uh, the um, uh, no Child Left Behind under the uh, George W. Bush administration um, happened, that really kind of put, uh, took, took things to a very different level. And that's where I think um, Welton, Dean and Welton really um, uh, start their, their discussion because what ended up happening is that under um, a no, uh, no Child Left Behind, uh, the, the policies were very punitive. Um, it was more of a stick than a carrot, if you will. The idea that if schools were not performing, if 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 uh, if if schools were not meeting a particular threshold on their um, uh, standardized tests, then schools would be punished. Um, not just individual schools, school districts would be punished, states would be punished, um, and that was the 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 idea is the, is that they would um, they could they could put uh, um, schools uh, under uh, need for uh, not meeting AYP um, the adequate. Uh, uh, um, a yearly progress, uh, and um, and uh, you know uh, they were used to kind of uh, rank and um, and literally just kind of shame schools into trying to perform better because what what you started seeing was that schools um, were were being ranked and comp and compared to each other on um, student outcomes and so um, you saw that proliferation happening under the the George W. Bush administration under No Child Left Behind. The other thing that we saw under No Child Left Behind was this um, this kind of movement really um, to to try to to um, privatize and and. And um, if, um, uh, not necessarily just privatization, but also charterization and other ways, and uh, to the to the extent that if schools were not performing to um, to the um, uh, level that. Um, you know, basic level that was that had uh, that had been um, a priori uh, defined, then um, the uh, uh, the state can can uh, step in and um, and take over the schools. Um, and so you started seeing um, this this idea of either state takeover, mayoral takeover, um, uh, schools being either shut down or uh, turned over to um, uh, other providers like charter providers, etc. And so the uh, the idea that um, uh, uh, there was a free market out of available and that this free market, you know, that the market can fix um, uh, schools became something that really that really um, took off uh, I think under uh, no child left behind although the seeds were kind of sown beforehand you started seeing some uh, 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 conversations of charter schools actually as far back as uh, as, as America 2000 um, uh, under George HW Bush um, really it, 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 it took off during George, the George W. Bush administration um, and the No Child Left Behind Act in, in 2002. Um, uh, as, we've, uh, as most folks have, have seen and have gone through the, this particular system, No Child Left Behind really was the, the one variable and the one kind of policy um, that um, kind of solidified um, a lot of, of the ways we think about schools and schooling in, in contemporary times. And although um, the, the newer um, reauthorizations of the of ESEA 
under Race to the Top and under ESSA, um, the, those newer um, uh, uh, ideals or those newer reforms rather, um, really um, didn't do much to kind of uh, move, move us uh, away from uh, testing and and it didn't do much to move us away from this idea of of um, uh, of market driven logics in schools. Um, and what they what they did was they shifted the the and they softened the the, the idea that you know instead of instead of puni uh, making things punitive instead of using a stick they were going to use a carrot. Um, and so uh, um, under a race to the top the sh the logics really shifted and 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 it was like if you want some of this federal money then um, here's the criteria that you have to do in order for you to participate in this particular you know if you, if you want it um, and which schools or which school districts are going to walk away from from these kinds of funds um, because they're although they the federal government is responsible for about five percent of of um, of school funding um, overall school funding. Um, those five percent really account, um, add up to very to millions of, of uh, potentially millions of dollars um, for for a school, and so um, it is important and vital that um, uh, you know the the you know folks were pretty much uh, administrators were were to, to remember that administrators were you know um, had their hands tied, um, and it was it was a it was a really tough situation. Uh, um, damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. Nobody wants to lose money um, in in that regard, and so I think that it was um, or walk away from money and, and not participate altogether. And so um, and so this idea that um, that standardized testing you know is is something that is with us is something that became solidified really. Um, uh, under no child left behind is kind of the primary message I think of of um, of, of the chapter. Um, another kind of message that I think is also important for us to remember is that you know um, that is that um, accountability, particularly uh, um, starting with uh, with a, a nation at risk, um, it led to this tradition of of testing. It led to this uh, 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 tradition of kind of you know of of utilizing tests to gauge student outcomes. And were there other ways? Possibly, yes. Um, but uh, but the ways in which we dealt with this uh, was uh, you know was through the logics of efficiency. It was easier to kind of design a test to test a, a variety of kids, a number of kids at one time, and to see if they were kind of meeting a particular threshold. And so. Um, and so uh, the the idea of testing um, kind of took off during this period, and we've been testing, and and uh, you know, and and this accountability logic has been with us, you know, since 1982. Um, and so we've been testing and testing and testing and testing for over 40 some odd years now, 50 some odd years. Yeah, um, and and we're not outside of that yet. And that's the that's the I, I, another big message is that. We have not moved away. It's been with us. It's also it's almost as though it's it's so natural to us. We can't think of a of a system outside of testing. We can't think of a different way to to understand accountability and and all the logics of accountability that follow. It's not just testing. It's rubrics. It's it's things of that nature. And so you know it's become so normal for us to to think about rubrics. It's become so normal for us to think about outcomes that that's the way we think. That's the way we believe education should function. Um, um, and that's not to say that that's that that's not uh, a, a part of education. It's just to say that the logics of of accountability have been with us for quite a long time, and we be, have naturalized it. It's, we think it's normal, um, but it's not normal. It's actually grounded in policy. It was something that was introduced to us, you know, prior to 1982. Schooling looked radically different. There was not this kind of rampant um, um, uh, uh, ethos. Of testing and testing and testing, and so uh, it, it's important for us to remember that testing itself is 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 a bit of a social construction. It's a bit of a of a policy construction. Somebody thought that that was the best way to to do education, and as a result, um, it, it became um, uh, embedded in um, in educational policy. And I think that that's what um, what um, Demon Welton want us to understand as well is that this is not kind of a, a normal or or a natural rather um, way of doing schooling. It is it is a it is a way in which somebody felt um, and very powerful individuals in this country felt was was the the way in which education should proceed now with that 
um, th this, this, uh, this logic of testing and this logic of accountability also introduce some other problematic logics, which I think Demon Welton didn't try to highlight in their text. One of those problematic logics is that it led to this kind of breakdown in, in traditional public schooling and this rise in neoliberal um, uh, markets, right? This idea that um, uh, we are going to use uh, test and accountability to uh, kind of um, fix uh, schools um, and especially fix failing schools. Um, uh, and, and you saw w w what ended up happening was that um, uh, you know, schools under No Child Left Behind especially became kind of targeted for closure, became targeted uh, as, as uh, not meeting uh, adequate yearly progress. And, and as a result, um, you saw this kind of proliferation of, of, um, of alternative um, schooling, schooling opportunities and schooling options for kids. Um, and so, again, this is not, this is not and, and I repeat, and it's important for us to kind of think about this, it's not kind of a poo-poo a, a on, on, on charter schools or a poo-poo on, on alternative schoolings. Uh, it, is the, it is more of a, a, to highlight that these logics were ushered in uh, under the guise of accountability. Um, and so because they were ushered in under the guise of accountability, the idea was that the markets could kind of fix, and, you know, would, would fix it. And so we dismantled um, uh, public schools, turned, turned these schools over to, to, to different kinds of providers. And sometimes the providers were, were, the, were the school districts or the states themselves um, and uh, in order to try to fix uh, this, this idea. That's, the, that's, the, that's the, to fix schools. That's the, the logics. And, um, and unfortunately, you know, what, what we've seen now when the data is, is yielding is that, you know, there's the, these different kinds of options were, by and large, were not very successful. They were not very effective, and especially they were not effective for the populations in which they were aimed to try to uh, address. And so black and brown kids are not performing, you know, by and large um, uh, in, in ways that they should be performing or that we think that they would be performing um, once, they, once we removed the... the, the uh, the the monies from from traditional schools and so um, you know it, it is it is a fascinating area of, of research that that many many individuals have looked at and um, and even uh, to date there was a, a recent report um, that that looked at um, uh, uh, the performance of charter schools and over 60% of charter schools close within five years um, of opening but they you know but uh, um, doing more of, of a disservice to um, uh, to the schooling system of, of, of kiddos um, and leaving um, traditional schools with less and less monies um, because monies you know they they took monies to, to to start up but then they closed off and so it's it's fascinating to look at some of that data and some of that information but um, suffice it to say that that many of these alternative off, uh, offerings did little to, ref to truly reform schools and um, especially for the most disadvantaged kids and um, and uh, what ended up happening instead is that um, it, it just kind of reinforced the belief that we just needed to kind of test them, that we needed to, to do more kind of discipline with these kids. What these kids needed was, a, was toughness. What these kids needed was more discipline and rigor. And, um, and, you know, and, uh, and if they didn't do that, then it was the kids who were responsible for their own failure. If they didn't succeed on the test, the kids were responsible for their own failure. Um, and, and it didn't... Um, uh, really look at other variables that were associated with um, school failure, things like, um, um, uh, I mean, racism, classism, you know, the, uh, an entire kind of social structure that is designed to reproduce inequities in schools. And so, you know, the, the fix, if you will, was to fix the student. They were designed to fix uh, students, these reform efforts, as opposed to fixing a system that um, that was failing kids. And so this is what Demon and Welton uh, have called um, color evasive individualism. You know, this idea that, you know, we're going to be colorblind, if you will, and, and, I, and I understand the logics why they don't want to use the term, but 
you know the idea that you know we we don't see color we don't see color this isn't about kids kids race this is about the individual performance and if these kids aren't performing then it's it's something something's wrong with the kids something's wrong with the family it's a, it's a very deficit kind of uh logic that um that demon welton are challenging in in their um uh in the in their in their particular um uh uh text and in this chapter um in particular so you know, what, what I think is important for us to kind of walk away with and what I want you to, to be really kind of thinking about as you um, are reading this text, as you're processing some of the information that's there, you know, is, it, are, are a couple of different questions. Why did accountability unfold the way it did? You know, what were some of the, what not just the, the kind of logics, but what were the thinking? What was the thinking behind this when the accountability discourse was introduced back in 1982? You know, how, why did it unfold that way? Could it have unfolded differently? Um, and if it did, why didn't it? What were some of the interests that, that were there? What were some of the ideological interests that were pushing this, um, this, this idea of, of, of accountability? And why was the nation at risk? You know, it's, it's fascinating for, for me as, as a professor um, to, to think about that idea of, of um, schools failing or this country failing. We're failing internationally, economically, and schools are to blame. Right. It's it's a fascinating kind of leap to say the reason why we're failing um, competitively, we're not we're not competing against these industrialized and industrializing nations is because schools are doing their job, you know, because on the flip side, you know, there were moments in which this country was doing great economically. And, you know, no one ever said, you know, thank you to schools for all the great work that they did to get us to get us uh, uh, to get our economy going again, to jump starting our economy. And so it's fascinating for me to think about, you know, the ways in which schools get blamed when this country's economic woes are, are, are dire, but schools get zero credit when, when, the, when the country is doing well economically and financially. And so it's, it's food for thought, the way in which kind of schools are wrapped up in this kind of broader economic discourse. And so I want us to kind of think about, you know, what's the relationship between um, the, the broader economy and this accountability, and in particular, why did it accountability unfold the way it did um, under um, uh, uh, a nation at risk and every other subsequent iteration of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. The other thing I think I want you to be thinking about is, you know, races, race and racism and how that's always been a factor in, in, in the ways in which educational policy has unfolded. Um, I think Demon, Demon Welton have done a really fascinating job in getting us to think about, you know, race and racism and how um, there was color evasiveness from the very beginning, from the time in which um, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act was, was formed, um, that it was very race neutral. They didn't talk about race. They talk about disadvantage and it didn't really kind of address address the, the, the race issue head on. And because it didn't address the race issue head on, then it became something that was not very much you know, embedded in the policy. And so every subsequent iteration of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act you know, didn't deal with race and racism until you started seeing, um, again, you know, under No Child Left Behind, when you started disaggregating some of the data. Uh, and once you started disaggregating the data by race, then you really started to see um, how, how different kids were performing. Now, that said, again, again, how did race and racism then get taken up at that moment, right? Race and racism, you know, again, were not addressed systematically. And that's, again, you know, the, the ways in which policy is, is being unfold, uh, is, is unfolding, educational policy is unfolding in this country is something that we need to pay attention to. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and the ways in which color evasiveness is wrapped up in, in, in this logic. And so I, I just kind of, I, I really want you to pay attention to that second question. You know, how is racism a factor in the way educational policy has unfolded historically? And think about that, you know, and, and, and really um, take time to, to, to understand how um, uh, we don't really deal with the issue of race and racism um, as, a, as, a, as a society. We're kind of dealing with, um, with the effect of racism, but we're not dealing with race and racism head on. And so, you know, the last thing I think is important for you, for, for you to, to take on um, is to think about reimagining. What, what could it look like if we would have, if we would have um, 
dealt with um, with race and racism from the beginning? What would it look like if we didn't kind of tether um, accountability to to um, to market logics? You know, and so you know, uh, what would it look like if testing were not punitive? Um, you know, what I think you know, really engage in this in this uh, in this idea of reimagining something different. I think that's the kind of courage to 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 to. Um, uh, step into to really kind of rethink, reimagine what schooling could look like, what accountability could look like. Does accountability always have to be um, uh, dependent on testing? You know, um, I think that we we think it is because that's the way it's unfolded. That's what's natural to us. But is it possible to uh, disentangle those two ideas? Um, I want you to kind of to to really kind of engage in that in some of that thinking, and and hopefully we'll have we'll be able to have a little bit of that discussion um, at, at at the next uh, uh, at our next class. So let's move right along and let's uh, and let's talk about the next issue uh, that that Demon Welton uh, tackle, which is the issue of school discipline. Now, um, in uh, their their particular um, uh, book. Uh, in chapter seven, um, they, they identified two particular quotes. Uh, the first one is, black students are more frequently and harshly disciplined, not because they act out or more, or uh, act like because they act out more or engage in more severe behaviors in other peer groups, but unfortunately because schools largely view them through a deficit lens. Again, it's taking on the issue of, de of deficit thinking and deficit logics um, that were raised in the previous chapter, chapter, chapter five, or, and, uh, and has taken it to this issue of discipline, you know, that, that, the, that this idea of um, kids are the ones who are broken, kids are the ones who need to be fixed, kids are the ones who need to be held accountable, you know, is wrapped up again in this idea of school discipline. Now, uh, Demon Welton really are tethering this to kind of broader school to prison pipeline um, thinking, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's also kind of important for us to, to consider in the background, but for the most part, I think what, what's, what's important here is to think about the ways in which uh, our own policies, our own practices are really setting the foundation to look at kind of kids' individual behavior in isolation. This idea, if you will, of um, color evasive um, um, individualism that were raised uh, in the beginning of the book and brought again in, in chapter five um, uh, uh, is certainly something for us to, 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 to take up and, and to consider. Um, the second quote, I think, uh, um, black high school students had more negative perceptions of their school racial climates as compared to their white peers and their experiences with racism was associated with getting lower grades and more detentions and suspensions than their white peers. This idea that not only are, are schools treating kids differently, but kids, especially kids of color, black kids, are experiencing and seeing uh, uh, different kinds of, 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 um, of, of racial uh, context and they're experiencing school fundamentally different than their, than their white peers. And that experience in itself is, is also kind of a, 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 way, a, a way that's almost setting them up you know, so it's not just, you know, them being treated in a particular way, but they're going into a space already thinking that the space is against them. And so, you know, it's, it's a fascinating kind of um, um, uh, cycle because, because the, the, the cycle itself is really um, uh, one that reproduces um, and locks us in this um, racialized logic of... Um, uh, of, of us versus them and helps us, I think, kind of think about the ways in which school discipline kind of became a vehicle for us dealing with, um, with um, the, the black student uh, writ large. Um, uh, one of the things that I think is, is, is important for us to kind of a, a, a big takeaway from this is that, you know, um, is that a lot of our policies that we do in schools a lot of the, the policies and the practices that we engage in, um, the zero tolerance policies, the discipline policies, whether they're referring students to um, you know, uh, our referrals and what they're referring for, um, whether it's in-school suspension, out-of-school suspension, expulsions, um, anything, detentions, all of those are wrapped up in some sort of ideology. 
some sort of, uh, of equity issue. Um, and what is the ideology? According to Demon Welton, the ideology is this idea of kind of race, um, that, 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 that um, kids are responsible, it's race neutral, and kids are responsible for their own behavior. But the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, when you look at the numbers, the, 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 it's overwhelmingly black and brown kids that get um, that get disciplined, that get overly disciplined, that get the referrals, that get ISS, that get you know they get more OSS than ISS, that but or or they get um, the expulsions. And so, um, what's important for us to kind of take away from this chapter is how do how do these policies, how do our own practices that we have in schools. Um, and that we engage in every day, that we think it's just normal, routine practices, how are they reinforcing um, and reproducing um, uh, the logics of uh, racialized logics and anti-blackness? That's what Demon Welton want us to, to tackle. That's the, the issue that they really want us to look closely at, our own practices. And so in this class and in this class and in the class with Dr. Torres, the, the reason why we want you to, to think about you know, equity audits is that you know, are our own practices yielding, resulting in inequitable outcomes for students? That's the reason why we're wanting to look at these numbers. You know, do you, are you having different kinds of referrals? Are black kids being referred to in uh, uh, in terms of in terms of referrals, are they are they um, being referred more as a kind of insubordination or things of that nature? You know, what's the what kind of referrals are, are kids of color getting? What kinds of referrals? What kinds of outcomes are they having when you're thinking about ISS or OSS? What's the outcome for for kids of color? Are they different? And if they are, then it's a reflection of something that's happening inside the school of an of a logic of a thinking of a of a of a mindset that is. Um, that is uh, prevalent within your school. And we want you to kind of be thinking about how, um, how, inequity, how inequity is wrapped up in the very policies and practices that you enact as administrators and that we take on as schools and school systems. And so um, uh, it's, it's important for us to be thinking about those issues as well. And so, you know, we're setting the foundation for you to be thinking about um, how these, you know, when the, the, how our own policies and practices may see, may appear to be neutral, may appear to be racially neutral on the surface at the, at, at a very kind of real level, they're actually resulting in very different in, and inequitable outcomes, particularly for our minoritized students. And so, um, it's important for us to kind of think about that. But also, I think Demon Walton are pushing it even one step further. They're saying that a lot of the kind of alternative ideas, the alternative reforms that we've implemented, things like RTI, things like restorative justice or restorative practices, um, things like um, uh, um, SEL and trauma-informed, and a lot of the kind of the new, new and nouveau kind of thinking about how to deal with these issues, they are also part and parcel of the problem, that they're not, um, uh, they're not really dealing with the, with the race and racism issue on the surface, but they're kind of all focused and targeted on reforming the student. They're saying, this is the way you need to behave. These are normal practices. These are good practices. And so this it reinforces the belief that it's the kid who doesn't have these practices. It's the kid who's deficient. And so it's, it's again, it's an ideological shift that, need to be, that needs to happen within schools because these are the practices. These are what we think are normal things that, that, that we've taken on, that we've normalized in schools and um, and uh, and and as a result they're reproducing these kinds of logics right this is what we're effectively saying is this is this is the way we want you to behave um, black and brown kids and if you and if you're not then something's wrong with you you're broken and 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 because you're broken then you know then we need to deal with you in these particular ways and so that's the that's the thinking that's the logic that needs to be kind of um, uh, uh, disrupted and so um, again, it, it's, it's a fascinating um, um, way to kind of look at, uh, at, at this work and why the work of Demon Welton, and Demon Welton is so important in helping us to understand why it is that we need to do things like equity audits for us to, to, um, to, to move forward in, um, in, uh, in making schools better places. I want to talk about the last two slides kind of um, very quickly. Um, because I do think that um, Demon Welton are kind of, you know, saying that there are ways to deal with the with with this, and and ways in which we can um, uh, move beyond 
this kind of deficit thinking and and they articulate that you know a, a few of the ways in which that can happen is by engaging youth is by really kind of talking to the youth doing some youth participatory action research um, hiring more teachers of color addressing issues of anti-blackness and being very strategic and being very intentional in making sure that we as social justice leaders are um, making every effort that we can to make schools better places for our black and brown kids um, and that they're and that we're not reproducing deficit logics um, with our um, students on a day-to-day -day basis whether it's through testing or our discipline practice etc we need to be reflective of our of what we're doing in schools and we really need to be um, kind of checking ourselves we really need to be doing gut checks on a daily basis to ensure that we're not reproducing inequities and that we're, we're actually uh, doing work that's um, that's that's liberatory in nature as a opposed to uh, reproducing the status quo, which tends to um, uh, reify inequities for, um, for, for black and brown um, kiddos and black and brown communities writ large. So one of the things that I think is, is important for us to, 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 to engage as, as, um, as um, educational leaders is to really ask ourselves some questions. And those questions you know, are, you know, what, what are the sources of inequity at schools? How are we producing um, uh, and, and reproducing um, inequities on a day-to-day -day basis? What are our practices um, that, that we do that, that may result in inequitable outcomes for 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 black and brown kids, um, and uh, and in particular, you know, what is it? What is what does what do our discipline um, uh, numbers look like? What do our referral numbers look like? Um, uh, and how? And, and especially when we disaggregate some of that data, um, what are are we seeing those kinds of differences um, in uh, in our in our uh, numbers? You know, are we uh, uh, as uh, is our school a, a space that's truly equitable, or is it a space that is um, reproducing inequities, even at a very subtle um, ways that we are not aware of? And so, I do think that those are that 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 these are some fundamental questions that we need to be asking, that we need to start asking ourselves. Um, uh, as uh, critical and as um, uh, change agents of schools. Um, let me kind of segue to the last chapter just very quickly. And although um, Demon Walton talk about, you know, their protocol for anti-racist policy in this particular chapter, you know, it is very much, this is where they begin to actually say, you know, what we're, what we're doing is we're kind of echoing the logics of an equity audit, right? We're taking a step-by-step -step systematic analysis of, you know, how to make schools anti-racist. And, and, and they say it starts from the very beginning. It starts from who is sitting around the table. It's not, you know, are we including individuals that are truly representative, representative representative of our schools and our communities are you know, do are we giving equal voice not just to community members but our students part of that discussion are our community members part of the discussion our teachers part of the discussion um, etc or are we kind of making decisions for others so uh, from the very beginning you know you have to assemble the appropriate team and that you know that that team has to has to serve as a guide as a guidepost to um, really kind of get us an entree into understanding this and fixing you know our our our, our particular um, school context, you know, um, and once we kind of get our team together, we need to kind of um, really do the do the the work of um, of of understanding, you know, the the history of our schools. You know, how did we arrive at this particular space? Um, it. What are what were some of the demographic shifts that happened? How did we, you know, how was was our community? Did it always reflect the, the this population? And if it didn't, you know, um, what when did it change? How did it change? And as, and and what are what's the new challenges that we're facing as a school community? If it hasn't changed, if you live in a predominantly rural community, um, and it's and it's been pretty homogenous, you know, that's that's also a problem. You know, homogenous communities are are clearly part you know part and parcel of 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 uh, of of spaces where um 
uh, there were there were either no uh, white folks or no black folks. You know how did that happen, right? And again, you know, just because we're just because our spaces are homogenous, you know, does not necessarily mean that there's no racism there. These are actual manifestations. These are spaces of racism, and and they're vestiges of racism. You know that that are that that our schools are representing, and so we have to as as school leaders engage our our communities in having these kinds of discussions. How did we arrive at this at at, at this at this uh, particular juncture in our in our um, historiography? But at the same time, you know, what are some other sources of inequities that are there? Even if you have homogenous spaces, even if you're in an all white school, for example, um, you know. Uh, uh, there, you know, are there other di kinds of differences? Are there gender differences? Are there class differences? Are you know, are, you know, those are those are the, the the types of things that you need to be looking at because if it turns out that even in these spaces there are other other um, sources of inequities, then you know, then then your then your school is reproducing some sort of uh, of ideology at a, at a very kind of unconscious level, and so part of this work is really to become more conscious of our own practices, more conscious of our own ideologies, more conscious of the ways in which we're, we're functioning so that we can end this cycle. We can disrupt it and end it for not just for us, but for future generations of kids. And so, you know, it, uh, at the end, they talk about how this needs to be an ongoing iterative process. It doesn't just stop. It doesn't just kind of like, you know, um, uh, um, you know, we do our work and we write up a report and, and we, we go. It, it has to be an ongoing process where we are um, reassessing, taking action, reevaluating and starting all over again. You know, to from you know to to revisit with our teams and making sure that we're 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 figuring out how to uh, make our schools a better, um, more viable, more vibrant, more whole uh, and holistic um, space for um, not just um, uh, our our uh, ourselves, but for our um, uh, communities and our our most um, uh, minoritized communities in particular. So. Um, that's the, the, the lesson that I think Deem and Welton are, are wanting us to get from, from, uh, from this uh, set of, uh, of readings. And, um, and I, I hope that I've done justice to it through this presentation. We'll see you all next week. Thanks very much and uh, take care.